I would like it if, if we could go back uh, to the early 90s uh, sure. with Soundgarden and uh, what happened and maybe talk a little bit on uh, your audience back then and mm -hmm. what your music did to, to change. Mm -hmm. so okay, great. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, let's go. Um, we are free in the game. What? We're, we're ready to go. We're rolling. Okay. We're rolling. Yep. Cool. Um, so when Soundgarden started, what was your ambition? Really, you know, uh, at the time that Soundgarden first started, it was just three of us. It was it was me and Kim Thiel on guitar and Hiro Yamamoto on bass, who had become my roommate. Uh, and he played bass and I played drums at the time. And because we lived together, we thought, well, we're a rhythm section, let's start a band. And I had been in several bar bands at the time from about 17 to then, I think I was 20. And I had this idea or this ambition that if I were a, a fantastic drummer and just focused on what I did and was very great, that um, some fantastic band that wrote great songs would knock on my door and say, come be in my band. And uh, you know, I had this image of some band like U2 at the time, you know, which was, they, were, they had put out, I think, three records. And I thought, the, the, this is what I'll be and this is what I want to do. And I was in several bands. And it was just one bad band after another. No one was writing songs I liked. Um, it wasn't music that I liked, really. And I came to the conclusion, I think at the same time as Kim and Hero, that if you want a band where you're playing music that you love, you just pretty much have to start it yourself. Um, and we did that. And I started playing guitar right at the same time, picked up the instrument strictly just to, to write songs on it. Knew nothing about the instrument, just started writing songs immediately, and we wrote 15 songs, I think, in a couple of weeks, and became a band that way, just, you know, and did it. We were then a band playing music that we liked. And I was singing from the drums, um, most of the songs, and Hero sang some of the songs, and that was kind of the beginning of, of the idea. Also, at the time, um, this was 1984, the very beginning. It was actually a very strong time in the U.S. for independent rock music. And all the records that I bought, I bought in like mom and pop stores that sold only indie music. And my ambition really at the time was to be part of that, that hopefully at some point somebody would let us make a record. Uh, and that, that, that was really the focus. But I mean, the rock and roll that was on the, the charts back then, mm -hmm. well, apart from, from bands like U2 and stuff, it, it was Bon Jovi and these kind of, I mean, the heavy, the heavy Yeah, U2, U2 wasn't even really on the charts. It was still a band that you kind of had to go search for if you lived in the U.S. Um, if you read, say, Rolling Stone magazine, you were more likely to read an article about Billy Joel than uh, anything or any kind of music that I liked. Um, and anything before that. Punk music was never uh, um, commercially successful. There were a lot of new wave bands that were on MTV, which was very young at the time, um, very commercial new wave bands. And then there was the, the hair metal bands like you said Bon Jovi and Poison was coming out, things like that, that we weren't fans of. And Soundgarden was not a band that was immediately liked by any stretch. Um, the Seattle music scene at the time was really sort of made up of other bands as your audience. So if we played a show, our, our audience was made up of other bands. And when, when a band like, say, Green River or the Melvins played a show, the, their audience was us from Soundgarden and a couple other bands. And that was it. And I think it really formed me as a musician and maybe even as a person And that um, you have that decision to make, I think, at that time when you believe in the music that you're writing and that you're playing, and you may not necessarily be liked by everyone, um, but we had the perseverance and the attitude that we believed in what we were doing, and so we just kept doing it anyway. Um, and that was really, I think, the spirit of what was happening at the time in, in the mid to late 80s in Seattle. You talked of uh, commercialism. Was that something you tried to avoid, something you didn't want to be part of? The, there was a term which was called alternative music, and at the time what that meant was it was virtually anything that wasn't part of the mainstream, that wasn't part of the status quo. 
It, it later became a genre which included certain things and excluded certain things. It meant sort of jangly guitar, or what was sort of becoming a college music sound. Um, the lyrical themes tended to be darker, tended to be more social oriented. It didn't have to do with girls and cars and, and drugs and the things that were kind of considered to be rock music themes of the period. So it was very different in that regard. We didn't really have any idea that what we were doing would ever become part of uh, uh, the commercial status quo or, or become commercially successful. And there were no people, no record labels at that time coming to Seattle looking around for, to sign the next rock band that would sell millions of records. That didn't happen. But that's also a big reason why I think the, the music was so strong because we were all doing it literally for the sake of entertaining ourselves and making good music. So, uh, and then the record labels came. Uh, then the record labels came and Soundgarden was actually the first band that kind of started to draw that. And that was a combination of different people. Mike Borden, who was the drummer of Faith No More at the time, um, saw Soundgarden in Seattle. I believe we played a show with them when they had their original singer, um, Chuck something or other. What's his name? Yes. And uh, I gave him a tape. It was like one of the first tapes we'd ever recorded on 4-track. And he gave it to someone at their record company, which was a, a subsidiary of Gethin, I think, at the time, or someone that was interested in them. Um, and then a woman named Faith Henschel ran the local college station at the U University of Washington. And she sent a tape of Seattle bands out to some major labels. Um, and the tape was titled Bands That Will Make Money. And it was kind of a joke, I think, in her mind, but she really believed in what was happening in Seattle at the time and that it could be the future of rock music. So rather than Soundgarden actually going out and soliciting big labels and saying, please sign us, um, it just started to happen. The phone started ringing and I was answering it. We had no management and uh, I, I was actually pretty surprised at the interest. Um, Around that same time, the, the label Sub Pop was sort of put together by two people that we were friends with, and we suddenly got an offer to actually make a record and be on an independent label. Um, we also got interest from SST, which was a label that had a lot of bands we were huge fans of, like the Bad Brains, Husker Du, Sonic Youth. Um, to us, that was really the dream come true. And we backed off on the idea of being on a major label because we didn't think that they would reach our audience. And we were, we were right to think so. To this day, um, our SST record has sold more copies than our first A&M record, which came out later. Uh, the, the, the transition where radio, for example, or MTV were playing music like what we were performing hadn't happened yet. Um, so we held off with the idea of signing with a major label and we just sort of stuck to our guns and, and made independent records. But we were the first band to start getting that kind of attention. And um, that didn't just start with Seattle. You have to include bands like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, Metallica, Husker Du, um, Jane's Addiction. In a way, Soundgarden was kind of the band that all of the labels wanted to sign that, weren't, that didn't get to sign Jane's Addiction. We were kind of going to be the next Jane's Addiction, I think. And Jane's Addiction, to be fair, I think was the band that was going to be the, the next Guns N' Roses for all the labels that didn't sign them. So, you know, it, it happened in that way. Once labels started to come to Seattle and they were coming to see Soundgarden, they saw other shows and looked around and noticed, well, there's more than just this one band going on here. There really is a scene, and it, and it was a very rich scene. And the whole thing snowballed and happened very quickly after that. Do you remember when you first uh, when it first dawned on you that this thing, this scene, has become a worldwide success? The f I think the first time um, Soundgarden, for example, was really ever written about, um, where the music was taken seriously and and was presented as something that might be the future of rock, was was uh, an article in the Village Voice, which was out of New York City, and w was, uh, other than one rock magazine, in, uh, which was a monthly in Seattle, uh, it was the first time anyone had ever really noticed us, and even more so, I think, than the Seattle press. And 
that just combined with seeing the other bands and what else was going on around us, that was the first time that I thought, well, maybe people might care about us other than just our friends and the, and the local music scene. Um, the first time I really felt like this could really be the future of rock music um, happened with a conversation with, with Bruce Pavitt from Sub Pop, where he really confidently one day just kind of put his arm around me and said, this whole thing is going to blow up internationally and, and it's going to be huge everywhere. And he had this glint in his eye um, where he, he just knew it. And that was the first time I thought where I saw, this is a person I know, he's very smart, he knows new music, he knows indie music, he knows what he's talking about. Um, and that was the first time I actually kind of believed him. And it was also, you know, the realization that this can happen without us changing our clothes, changing our hair, changing the titles of our songs, doing anything differently than what we do, because we knew that we would never do that. Um, and that was always my fear along the whole way, was that we were not capable of changing who we were for anyone, uh, for an audience, for a record company, for television, for anything. So it was going to have to be done on our terms. And slowly but surely, we saw that the industry was kind of shifting toward us. And we weren't ever going to be put in the position where we would have to think about shifting toward that. Um, you talk of, of the Seattle scene. Is it fair to put you in the same category as bands like Frozen, uh, Rotten, Nirvana, Alice in Chains? I mean, are there sort of the similarities between these bands? There were, I think. Uh, more uh, more so what we left out necessarily than what we put in. Um, I think one of the biggest reasons why a band like Nirvana appealed to such a broad audience was the fact that y you went from seeing a video of a band like Whitesnake where you have the singer's model wife doing doing a strip tease act on the hood of a of a Jaguar and basically all of these rock bands presenting themselves as having a lifestyle that you will never have that's very special and it's very exclusive and then you see a video w with a band like Nirvana where the band essentially looked like everyone and their friends at high school looked like and it was proof that uh, anyone can do it you don't have to look a particular way um, you can just be who you are make great music and it will appeal to people And then you got in the, in the press, uh, I mean, I think on the basis of some misunderstanding, um, if we were labeled grunge bands. How did you feel about that, uh, that label? I had a mixed feeling about it. I think if, if I listened to a Nirvana record, a Pearl Jam record, a Alice in Chains record, a Soundgarden record, we all sounded like completely different bands to me. And that was just kind of a kernel of the entire scene uh, in Seattle, where there were a lot of other bands, there was a lot of uh, goth influence going on, there was performance art, the, uh, it was such a broad spectrum of music that um, there tended to be kind of a focus on the bands that had more of like a, an aggressive guitar sound, an aggressive singing, kind of an angry presentation of what we did. There was more than just that. Um, It felt good, I suppose, to be part of a scene um, that, that was getting international critical success. But also, on the other hand, Soundgarden loved autonomy. We liked to feel like we were just us and we weren't part of anything, and it was us against the world. So on the one hand, it felt like a blessing. On the other hand, it felt like we want to be seen as only us. And when I would sit down to do interviews time after time after time, um, I wanted to be talking about my band my guitar player, my drummer, my music, my bass player, not about, you know, tell us about all these other bands as well. Um, looking back on it now, of course, I'm very proud and, and realize that I'm very lucky to have been a part of that scene, because that doesn't necessarily happen. Um, I'm sorry. Um, why do you think that, that you were compared to all the other bands? I mean, geographically, you're in the same place. So it, it, it was strictly that. You know, it, it was geography. It was m more than anything else. Because, like I said, you know, there were other bands um, from other parts of the country that were part of that, or that were predecessors. Bands like the Replacements or, or um, REM, for example, um, 
what we were doing and how it was viewed, it, it couldn't have happened without those bands as well. But because Seattle had never been focused on at all, ever, uh, and there were so many bands that were making great records and great songs from this one little town no one had looked at, it just made it easier for the, the media to kind of focus on it and to look at it as a, as a movement, like they looked at uh, the British punk scene. Um, it, it was just easier to describe it that way. But lyrically, there was a kind of a, a feeling of the same kind of anti-Clarkness or mm -hmm. whatever in, in, uh, in most of those bands. Mm -hmm. do, do you agree with that? that I do. I uh, focused on some of the same themes. I, I, and I, I think that that's somewhat generational. Um, a response to the music that we had been hearing that was part of the mainstream. Um, not being interested in it, wanting to present something else that's going on, um, which included a lifestyle. Um, my band, you know, by by no measure was a straight edge band, but we didn't participate in what you think of as like normal rock activities out on the road. It wasn't a room full of strippers and tons of drugs and going out to parties every night. We weren't that way. Um, you know, h half the band had w were college educated. Um, we all read books. <laughs> we, you know, we were ba we were sports fans maybe, but it wasn't. Uh, there were very few similarities between us and what was the rock status quo at the time. Um, th there was no S Seattle band that you could compare to like uh, Def Leppard when it came to going and seeing the show. And I would I literally have friends that would come to a Soundgarden show and be backstage in, in the dressing room and be looking around and be completely disappointed because it looked just like this. Um, you know, maybe there would be a bottle of whiskey on the table or something, but that was it. There were no drugs, there were no prostitutes or groupies or anything like that. And we would be having kind of round table discussions and arguments about philosophy and things that interested us and playing records for each other uh, of other indie bands. And one of the first times I met Kim Thiel and realized that this is a guy I want to be in a band with was when we were just discussing music. We were listening to um, the second Meat Puppets record and couldn't believe that there was a band out there making music like that. And agreeing on music and on film and on literature to us was more interesting than, um, you know, how many girls are we going to get or how many different types of drugs are we going to be able to mix together and then live this incredible rock and roll lifestyle that seems to be everybody's dream. Um, I, I think that type of energy, w when you look at the rebellion as being part of rock music, actually came out in the music versus uh, writing party anthems and then that behavior coming out in our lifestyles. This attitude and this, uh, this uh, outlook uh, struck a chord in, I, I think it's safe to say, an entire generation. Mm -hmm. um, how does that feel? I mean, so all of a sudden, seeing this band all over the world. It, it, it was surreal. It, you know, it was really hard, I think, to even digest or understand. Um, it also immediately changed the scene. It, it in, a, in a sense, kind of destroyed the scene. Um, the first time, for example, I went to Hollywood and we were taking meetings with Geffen Records and A&M Records, um, the first time I ever saw Sunset Strip, I was with Kim and there, there was a Tower Records and there was a, uh, a big to-do because David Lee Roth's first solo record was coming out. And he was a mountain climber or something, so they built this sort of giant fake Matterhorn on the top of Tower Records and he was rappelling down it. And there were cameras and everyone there to see that. And Kim and I saw that and we just walked the other direction as quickly as we could. Um, Sunset Strip was a place where people from all over the country or all over the world moved to Hollywood to be part of that club scene, start a band, and become famous. Um, we didn't leave our town. We, we stayed where we were. We made the music that we wanted to make, and people came to us. Uh, so it, it, in a sense, became very surreal and very comic book-like. But then all of a sudden, um, Bands like Green River, which then became um, you know, splintered off into Mother Love Bone and Mud Honey and then Pearl Jam, um, obviously Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, Nirvana, Tad, Screaming Trees. We all 
started touring and traveling all around the world. Therefore, we were never in Seattle anymore. And what that initial club scene was transformed. Within two years, I went to Hollywood and uh, I started seeing people walking up and down Sunset Strip wearing flannel shirts and having hair dyed green. Um, there was no more like long hair ripped jeans and Guns N' Roses t-shirts. There were no more people with teased hair and makeup looking like poison. Um, it, it, a city that would have normally rejected a scene that would come out of a small town like Seattle or a city like Minneapolis or, or Athens um, transformed. And Seattle became this mecca where everyone was traveling from all parts of the country or the world to live there and, st and start a band. It was, it was a very strange thing. Our sound man had a, uh, a rehearsal space that he started where he would rent out little rooms for you to rehearse in. I think there were 15 rooms and Soundgarden rehearsed there I think one time and half the rooms were empty. Within three years he had about 80 rooms and they were all filled with people from all over the place coming there to start bands and get record deals, which was the opposite of what the scene was and how it started out and why it was ever exposed or vital in the first place. Uh, and that all happened literally within the period of about four years. And the fans you had, the fan base, I mean, not necessarily the ones in following in your footsteps, but just ordinary teens uh, mm -hmm. kind of buying into the whole the grunge mindset. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe them? It was an interesting mix because uh, we, we had... Um, Sorry, it does have 20 minute mark. Oh, okay. It's subtle, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially when you said it. Yeah. When we um, when we first started out as Soundgarden, we we had mostly had punk rock audience and kids with skateboards coming to see us. Uh, um, people who are fans of bands like Killing Joke. People who are fans of bands like The Clash. Um, and then uh, more current bands that were like indie bands. Bands. Um, like Big Black or, or uh, Sonic Youth or Bad Brains, suddenly uh, there were elements and influences in Seattle bands that were drawing people from the suburbs who were really just metal fans. And those two groups were coming together and in in clashing in some ways. Sometimes it was violent. It was a little uncomfortable and it was a little bit unusual. And to know who our fans were suddenly became a little bit confusing. Um, there were the fans that were wearing plaid shirts and had long hair, but two years before that had a mohawk. Then there were the fans that had plaid shirts and long hair because they'd always had plaid shirts and long hair. And, you know, they had just taken off their Aerosmith shirt to put on a Nirvana shirt. Um, so it was, it, it was a little confusing. And I think to, to some degree when these bands, these Seattle bands became commercially successful, um, it, it became a little awkward when you would look through a magazine and see a Soundgarden article or a Pearl Jam article and then you would turn the page and it would be an article on, on Great White. We started feeling a little bit uncomfortable and self-conscious, like well, does that make us the same thing? Um, and I think at that age, when you're in your early 20s, those existential dilemmas are always at the forefront. And those are the things, you know, you're still discovering who you are. And the kind of music that you make and that you're presenting is, is really more important to you than anything. Um, the answer, obviously, as you get older and you discover you are who you are, and the music that you make is the most important thing. And it doesn't matter um, who you're associated with, even if it's in print. But uh, it felt to me like there was a, a definite awkward period. And what I refer to kind of, or Tom Morello refers to as the punk rock guilt. This was the first generation of people who were raised on punk rock music and kind of followed the punk rock Bible, but that suddenly were having incredible uh, commercial success. And I think that, that what happened with, with Kurt Cobain is, is probably the easiest way to present that and say this was the, the worst example, I think, of the outcome of that kind of clash. Um, um, okay. 
um, in talking to Tom as well, mm -hmm. um, he said that all of uh, all of these bands in the early nineties were cool. Mm -hmm. uh, all the right bands were conflicted in some sense mm -hmm. in that they hated arena rock. Absolutely. And found themselves playing arena. Absolutely, and and. I think with Soundgarden, we really, uh, I think part of the end of the band was kind of uh, a culmination of reaching that level and feeling like the, the best period that we could remember and that we participated in was Soundgarden playing really theater tours, um, playing at nighttime. We, we felt like Soundgarden playing at, in the daytime, even at a festival or Lollapalooza, was a little bit awkward. We felt like we were a dark, uh, more gloomy or aggressive rock band um, that lived well in an environment at night. When uh, we were playing hockey arenas, it, it didn't necessarily feel like that was us putting our music in the in the best light. And my personal revelation really was when we went on tour with Guns N' Roses. I wanted to be able to bring my music to as many people as possible. Um, and I loved the fact that on a tour like that, we could play a club on an off night in front of a thousand people, and then the next night we could play Wembley. Um, but when I saw Guns N' Roses and I saw the fact that they had two moving stages moving around Europe or the U.S. at the same time, um, they had two keyboard players, three background singers, these giant inflatable monsters that were from the first record cover, um, the size of the audiences. Uh, what it was that they were doing to present this enormous show and I looked around and, and we all did and we thought this is where we will end up this is sort of like the height of where it is that you go and I didn't want it I didn't like it um, and to me that was kind of the beginning of the end in closing um, I would like to uh, we're doing a program on the Beck song Luca oh yeah, yeah. Um, so, if you don't mind, you know this. A song. whole program on this song. A whole That's great. program on Luca. Um, on that song. So, if you don't mind, I would like you to talk about it. Talk sure. About it. I have a few questions about it. I have questions about it myself. Okay. So, you ask yours. All right. Um, do you remember when it first came out, uh, that song, that single? Absolutely. What did you think about it? Then? I, lo I loved the song. I loved the video, especially. I loved, the, I loved Beck's attitude, um, the characters in the video. Uh, came out at a time when video budgets, including even Soundgarden vi video budgets, were like apexing, you know, and like starting to to be the same as the budget for recording the entire record. And the video seemed very homemade, and Beck's attitude seemed very childlike and and uh, very free. But it also seemed like th this is a guy who's extremely intelligent, also and extremely talented. Um, what impact do you think that song made? I think it, there was a crossover in particular, there's the approach to the lyrics. Uh, the lyrics were poetic, but it was also kind of in a style of, of rap and had elements of hip hop. And yet it's this young, blonde California kid where half the time he's wearing part of a wetsuit, which to me was very California. Um, and th that to me had a huge impact. Uh, I think that hip hop lent itself to all kinds of crossover like you saw with Aerosmith and Run DMC. Uh, and you, but you had seen it sort of present the hip hop act first and then they include elements of rock. This was kind of the other way around. This was something that was rock or that was indie-ish, but it was including elements of hip hop in a very natural way. Um, which I think, you know, it's, it's hard to say this is the exact impact or this is how big the impact was but it was the first time that I saw it where you were actually literally seeing it on television. And what was your question? My question was, what did the words mean? The, the line that he says in the chorus hook before he says, I'm a loser, baby. Why don't you kill me? What are those words and what do they mean? Soy un perdedor, Spanish meaning what? I think it means Ah, okay, great. <laughs> I'm a loser in Spanish, fantastic. Um, okay. Why 
is that song that you're doing still important today? Um, I think I think any song that's sort of timeless and makes an, a cultural impression at any time, it's always going to remain important somehow. I don't know why. Um, you, I think that one, like one of the things that I was concerned about was Soundgarden, because you never know. Um, are the records that we're making going to be timeless, and are we going to become a band that is considered a classic band that people will still want to hear our songs and buy our records, or aren't we? And only time will tell. But one of the things I realized is when you're kind of the first one that does it, and you do it for the right reasons, um, there's an essence to that that really is, is based on truth and people are attracted to truth. And, and I think this song had that. I also think it wasn't self-conscious at all. It was freedom of expression, and freedom of expression is always very attractive. My pleasure. Can you just pass that back and forth? I've got a wide shot, so we should see that. Just put, if you wouldn't mind just passing that over and then looking at it so you've got it in a wide shot. Anyway, we're right on the bus, so yeah, just pass it. Yeah, um, there you go.